If you've never played a single game of StarCraft in your life, it's probably easy to tell that this requires some skill. And even if you know nothing about Super Smash Bros, it feels good to see a combo like this, especially in a tournament where the stakes are so high. There's something instinctively impressive when we see someone doing something really difficult, especially when they're doing it extremely well. Even outside of competition, it's easy to recognize when someone has a lot of skill. One thing you hear over and over from WoW players is that PvP is brainless, and that some comps can do nothing and win. If we step away from the salt, it's easy to see why this is so blatantly wrong. And over WoW's history, we have made icons out of highly skilled players. But what does it actually mean to be good at PvP? Can we narrow it down to one thing, like technical mastery? Or is it much more complicated than we like to think? Today, we're going to be looking at some of the best WoW players of all time, figuring out what made them so great, and then learning what it truly takes to be good at PvP, and how we can all become better players. Over 11 years ago at a Smash Brothers tournament called Genesis, the United States and Europe would clash as Mango and Armada would meet in Grand Finals for the first time ever. Mango was the clear fan favorite, known for his aggressive, in-your-face style even when using Jigglypuff, who's one of the slowest characters in the game. This set would include one of the most iconic moments in esports history, as Mango predicts Armada's role and instantly kills him with rest. But nearly a decade later, a player named Hungrybox would become the best player in the world using the exact same character, but his style was much different. Instead of playing hyper-aggressive, Hungrybox played really patient and defensive, sometimes stalling the game by chain-grabbing the ledge in order to maintain an advantage. This led many players to develop an animosity towards Hungrybox. Some people considered his playstyle boring and that he wasn't even good at the game where he was supposedly number one in the world, eventually leading to a controversial moment where someone threw a crab, yes, a crab at Hungrybox after winning a tournament in 2019. Might be wondering what this has to do with WoW PvP and I promise I promise you, we will get there. But first, we have to understand one of the biases that we have when it comes to skill. Across all games and even sports, we tend to respect offense much more than defense. In basketball, it's fun to see your team score and it's really fun when a player scores a lot, like Michael Jordan scoring a career-high 69 points against the Cavaliers. Nice! On the flip side, some players develop an entire career playing defensively, and they tend to become a bit controversial. Sometimes when a defensive heavy player wins, people are a bit disappointed. You thought you won the fight? Why? You didn't do nothing. Esports are no different. We like to watch montages where players do things really fast, moments where quick reactions are required, and we definitely like to see moments where a player takes a huge risk that winds up paying off. Yo, did he just walk up slowly and down smash? <laughs> it's pretty obvious that we tend to associate skill with things like fast reactions, mind games, and sometimes even unnecessary risks. But it's important to recognize our bias towards offense over defense, especially when it comes to a game like WoW PvP, because there is one important part of games that we haven't talked about yet, and that's how they require lots of information. If you've been playing WoW for a long time, there's a lot of game knowledge you probably take for granted. You already know there are 12 classes and 36 specs, and between all of that, you're probably familiar with 30 of their spells. To be good at WoW, you first have to memorize a few hundred abilities, but then you have to know about talents and PvP talents, which means even more to memorize. There's a lot to remember when it comes to WoW, even before you step foot into Arena. I would bet money that even game developers don't have everything memorized. Do you know what this spell is? Easy enough, right? But what about this one? The comparison is often overused, but WoW is probably a lot closer to chess than it is to Counter-Strike. Not only do you have to memorize several comps and their win conditions, but you have to do it while also navigating your own, and this requires you to memorize endless combinations of patterns. We taught computers how to play chess, and they are programmed to never lose. Although we've never seen anything similar in WoW, we've seen glimpses into what perfect play might look like in other games, and one thing remains clear, that we are probably far from perfection. So with perfect play being outside of anything we can possibly understand, how do we decide what it means to be skilled? As long as we're human, we seem to have hard limits. We can't cheat our own physics to become faster than our opponents, but there's one thing we can do to become better, and it involves knowing more information about the game itself. 
During BFA, Cloud9 was able to become the best team in North America by following one simple strategy, play MLD and stall long enough to win in deep dampening. This strategy worked, and it was pretty common to see 15-minute games in nearly every series they played, which chat responded predictably by spamming Resident Sleeper. But this playstyle had already been in the works for multiple years at this point. Cloud9 really wasn't doing anything new, and it was apparent that dampening the enemy team could work, like it did at BlizzCon 2014. <clears throat> Just ignore who got second place that year. Just like in other games, sometimes being good at WoW means slowing the game down. But I know what some of you are thinking. Wait a second, skill cap. What about this player? He plays the game aggressive and fast. Doesn't that mean he's good? Of course, you can be good at WoW by playing the game fast and being the aggressor, but you can't play aggressive forever, especially if you want to consistently win. Throughout PvP history, playstyles have existed on a spectrum between defense and offense. On the defensive extreme, you have players who play to never lose, and on the offensive extreme, you have players that have no direction to go but forward. Both extremes have their problems. If you play too defensive, you might tire yourself out and never even get a chance to actually win. But if you play too aggressive, you're basically gambling. What the best players realize is that sitting somewhere in the middle yields the best results. Pro players who win tournaments don't like to take chances, and they also don't turtle all day or do anything reckless. Instead, they like guaranteed options. A 50-50 isn't good enough. To win consistently, you need to look for the 60-40s. This was apparent during late Cataclysm and throughout Mists of Pandaria if we look at three players. At the time, Jamili was widely considered one of the best offensive players in the entire game, and he was known for playing hyper-aggressive with his defensive cooldowns on both Mage and Shadow Priest. But during the same era, you had old guard players like Vinruki and Talbadar, who might have been slower mechanically, but focused most of their gameplay on choosing the most consistent and guaranteed options. Vinruki and Talbadar realized that in order to win, you don't need to be the fastest player. You just needed to have a deep understanding of the game, and that involves taking the fewest risks. This strategy seemed to work, as both Vinruki and Talbadar managed to secure back-to-back -back BlizzCon titles during that era, while Jamili's success seemed to be limited to ladder play. This isn't to say that Jamili is or was a bad player or that mechanical skill is worthless. Instead, the success of Enruki and Talbadar represent the start of an era in WoW PvP where consistency would reign supreme. Being the best at WoW would mean more than just mechanical skill. It would also mean making the most consistent decisions on offense, and sometimes, more importantly, on defense too. The era of consistency would be on full display at BlizzCon 2015, as the best RMD in the world would face off against the Turbo Cleave of Joe Fernandez, Botar, and Swapsy. Both of these setups were the apex comps of their type. RMD was an offensive powerhouse. It was the unstoppable force of 3v3. Turbo Cleave was a Swiss army knife of defensive cooldowns. Trying to beat it felt like trying to push an immovable object. The BlizzCon series would go down as one of the closest sets of all time, and SK Gaming would show the world how powerful consistency is on the game's biggest stage. In order to win, SK Gaming needed to have a block for every offensive push from skill caps. At the time, RMD had an insanely powerful cross CC setup. Frost Mages still had deep freeze, meaning that triple CC wasn't just possible, it was guaranteed. This forced SK Gaming to carefully plan their blocks for each RMD setup. On one go, Shamanistic Rage could be traded. The next, Vigilance, and for setups involving Blind, it meant trading Botar's Trinket. In the Grand Finals, Pry used Blind a total of 11 times on Botar. And each time, the Blind would be trinketed. This might seem pretty easy and straightforward, but it was part of the immense planning that went into their strategy. There was one Blind, though, that is worth mentioning. It's this one. Here. At first glance, this seems like nothing. After all, Botar had just trinketed nine blinds in a row. So what made this so special? Notice when Botar gets blinded this time, the rogue is right next to him. Now look at the rogue's buffs. Pry has the yellow buff from Bandit's Guile, which means his damage is increased by 20%. He also has his trinket proc, which at the time was around 20 to 30% more damage. If Botar trinkets this blind, he could be swapped to instantly. Instead, he waits for the rogue to shadow step and commit his kidney shot onto Swapsy before trinketing. Again, this might seem like nothing. It was just a trinket, but with the biggest prize pool of the year on the line, several pieces of game knowledge had to be carefully pieced together to form one single interaction that would wind up winning them the entire event. It wasn't some intense mechanical skill. It wasn't fastest reaction time. It was patience and planning that gave SK Gaming their win. That was 2015 though, so where are we today? 
Obviously, damage in Shadowlands is fast, and some level of mechanical skill is needed to be good at Arena. If you ask pro players in Europe, many of them will tell you that Marrow is probably the best player in the game. He is solid mechanically, but more importantly, he's incredibly consistent and has more game knowledge than most pro players. Throughout PvP history, there have only been a handful of people that have a combination of high mechanical skill combined with deep game knowledge. Getting to that level is almost impossible, but a select few players have made it work. Players like Snuts, Waz, and Marrow are incredibly rare, and they represent different eras of near-perfect play. But even without technical mastery of the game, it's possible to become one of the best. Vinruki is one of the best WoW players of all time, but he's not a mechanical wizard. Neither is Swapsy, who has won BlizzCon three separate times. So what does all this mean if you want to become better at WoW Arena? First involves recognizing that you might have a misunderstanding on what skill actually means. It's not just doing things fast, but instead doing things well. You don't have to have insane reaction speed to become Gladiator, Rank 1, or even win BlizzCon. Instead of just reacting fast, you need to be consistent. You should also recognize that defense is just as important and perhaps even more important than offense, even in other games. Super Bowl 48 featured the number one offensive team, the Denver Broncos, playing against the number one defensive team in the league, the Seattle Seahawks. People expected the game to be close, but the Seahawks wound up winning 43 to eight, which was one of the largest margins in Super Bowl history. Across all games, playing safe and choosing the consistent option is what actually matters the most. Being the best is much more than being fast. The second leg of the 2010 semifinal between Barcelona and Inter Milan was proof of the popular saying, offense wins games, defense wins titles. Barcelona had an unbelievable 86% ball possession and a combined 555 passes compared to 67 from Inter Milan. Inter formed an impenetrable wall, playing a conservative defensive strategy, blocking all of Barcelona's opportunities. This performance by Inter Milan led them through to the finals, where they eventually won 2-0. WoW is hardly different. No matter if you're playing your first arena or making your first appearance on the BlizzCon stage, you are faced with the same challenge. How can I choose the most consistent option? So does WoW take skill? We definitely think so, and you should too. But this requires us to realize one thing, that WoW is a game of information. The best players of all time aren't necessarily the fastest because they don't have to be. Instead, they focus on using game knowledge to make the most consistent decisions. They don't play to gamble because gambling is risky. They play to win, and a big part of this involves doing one thing, and that's to know more than their opponents. Thanks again guys for sticking around. A lot of work goes into these editorial videos, so appreciate all your love. If you want to help support the channel, please consider subscribing and be sure to check out skillcap.com. We know Arena is tough, and that's why we design our class courses to make you a better and smarter player. As always though, thanks for watching, see you next time.